involved in student education for the past 14 years. My role includes clinical supervision of students teaching undergrads and postgraduate students as well as supervision of research. She is passionate about mental health in occupational therapy, in particular the acute psychiatric setting and addiction care. Thank you, Sabina.
the percentages of people um, in relation to the language that's spoken. Most of the settings that we explored in terms of the participants that we had in our study was from a provincial setting rather than a private setting. So these were the types of um, stats that were coming up. Obviously, um, globally, as, as I've stated, the phenomenon of language values in healthcare services, it's documented in the various forms of literature. It's highlighted as a challenge consistently when working with diverse populations of people, but it's also highlighting that practitioners themselves are ill-equipped to navigate this problem. So it's easy to say the client or the patient doesn't speak the language, but do, have you made the effort to become more proficient in the languages that your clients speak? This obviously subsequently impacts on referral services, intervention processes, assessment processes within the context specifically in this study of occupational therapy practice, because this is what this study particularly aimed to explore. Um, because while there is literature around the problem of language barriers in practice, there is a dearth in the literature in occupational therapy practice. Um, but if you really, as we go through the study, you'll find a lot of the findings are uh, actually applicable to all domains of practice. So the National um, Language Policy Framework speaks about how the languages that clients speak should be prioritized in terms of how to engage with them on the clinical platform. So it's lovely in the Constitution and it's lovely in the Bill of Rights and we have all of these wonderful policies and white papers but the degree of implementation of all of these policies are very unclear. And it's important to mention this in order to foreground how it's actually a very big ethical responsibility or an ethical violation, firstly, of clients when we don't speak their language, um, when we are actually providing services to them. So one of the key aspects of service delivery as in mental health care services and in most services is comprehensive assessment and that this procedure needs to be very finely tuned in order to influence how one plans intervention and how one implements intervention. So literature is also talking about the experiences we all have. It supports the fact that there's significant challenges associated with all of these aspects of an intervention process as a result of language barriers being present in the first place. Um, and all of this, if you really think about it, it very sadly puts clients um, at a very big disadvantage. It's with clients, caregivers, their communities. Specifically, if you think about a South African healthcare context and how we deal with extremely high turnover and we deal with this revolving door system and live service uh, delivery level. And it's because things are not always clear, primarily possibly because language was a problem in the first place. So to look at um, the methodology, as I said, this is a qualitative approach. It was um, used to, to craft a design in order to gain deeper insights into the question that we've highlighted there around what are the experiences of South African OT practitioners in mental health care services when language barriers are present. Semi-structured interviews were used as our means of data collection and thematic analysis was employed in order for the emergence of Themes to come through. So, I'll, a quick look at our participant list. You'll see that all our participants were actually female OT practitioners. They had between two and seven years of experience in mental health practice, and the languages spoken in their practices primarily is listed here. But in the findings, it was unearthed that none, most of the participants only had one home language that was their primary language and that was English. So they were working with clients who had other languages, and these were just the three that were prioritized. Remember, we have lots of foreign nationals as well in a lot of our provincial um, settings, and they were not, they're not being represented on any level at all. So in terms of the findings and the discussion, I'm gonna speak about my findings and my discussion concurrently in terms of the literature that's supporting or against um, the types of things that we came up. You'll see that in, in, we came up with three themes in terms of language barriers and the OT process specifically. We had language barriers and ethical considerations and then language barriers and practitioner agency. 
So to go through this quickly, you'll see I've just given you a little bit of the findings that came through as we discussed it with some literature and what's in the inverted commas is around some quotes um, from our, the participants in our studies. So with theme one, we, the participants themselves express, express that the presence of language barriers in the South African context has a huge, as I said, impact on the tight turnaround times they experienced as practitioners and the time they get to spend with their, clin with their clients, as well as the high turnover rates, because there was prolonged assessment periods. So they would do these extensive assessments because they, were, they couldn't get to the core of the problem, and then before you know it, they actually had to be discharged because of this high turnover rate that we're working with. So one of the key aspects that also came through was the use of and the query around the use, uh, the accuracy of assessment findings. So we determine certain things and then you wonder if it's isolated to this is actually psychosocial or cognitive fallout or if this is actually simply a language barrier problem. So participants in this study reflected that this resulted in the loss of potentially very rich assessment findings because OT is a very this profession. We just want to know everything about everything. We have these extensive assessment processes because we want to know all about the clients that we work with. But if we are unable to articulate what we are looking for and our clients are unable to then articulate back to us what their narratives actually are, there's a big dearth in the actual assessment findings. So participants in this study explained how even interventions that we do with clients in certain settings are quite complex, they're quite abstract concepts of things like if we do life skills within groups, we're talking about things like conflict management or psychoeducation or time management and they're quite abstract concepts. And explaining these abstract concepts in the presence of a language barrier is very difficult. Included in the types of strategies that we use is things like psycho uh, PSR uh, programs and this, you know, in those programs you have things like psychoeducation, education, life skills, um, vocational rehabilitation. It's not always easy to articulate what you are trying to get across to the clients um, as a bottom line. So participants also expressed how language barriers hindered clients from expressing themselves properly. And if you think about not being able to express yourself properly with someone, how are you expected to actually build some sort of therapeutic rapport with them? and this actually hindered the therapeutic relationship. So the participants, the practitioners that we had in our study, they identified that there was a significant disconnect between themselves and the clients that they worked with throughout the OT process. And this leads into the next theme, which is around ethical considerations and language barriers. So the HBCSA has a lot to say around justice, non-maleficence, client autonomy, beneficence, and confidentiality as some of the baseline ethical principles that we adhere to. But a significant finding that was unearthed is the ethical tensions that are associated with language barriers in practice. So if you think about, I spoke about earlier, the, the three main languages that are spoken as the dominant languages specifically in the Western Cape, the participants identified that they had difficulty engaging with any other language that was not their own home language. And so this means that the clients who they were working with spoke another language and formed a large percentage of the client population in general. And if you think about this, it immediately um, speaks to the transgression of the ethical principle of respect because clients' home languages was actually not used as a means to respect intrinsic dignity associated with someone's culture. Participants also mentioned that working with clients with certain mental illnesses impacted on service delivery because it imposed this barrier between the client and the practitioner. So is something as basic as beneficence actually being upheld as a healthcare professional? Participants also mentioned that um, they made use of the, uh, um, the resources like translators, for example. Um, but this was not always the case in all set settings. In fact, in the five settings that the, client, that the uh, participants were in, only two of those settings actually had translators on employed in terms of the staff. And so other members of staff or the cleaners or other um, 
group members or other clients were used as translators. So there was the transgression of the principle of confidentiality as well. So how are you asking the person um, who is you know, taking care of the ward from a cleaning perspective to quickly come translate here with this client and who knows what this person is going to go out with because they are not bound by any HBCSA um, ethics. Um, quite a significant aspect in my, uh, ethics is one of my personal um, interests and so it, it has, the whole thing has, you could speak probably for another 20 minutes, half an hour about this particular theme alone. So we'll move on to language barriers and practitioners, a, practitioner agencies. Anyone who knows an OT knows an OT will always make a way. So we always do exercise agency on some level, despite the limitations present to ensure that service delivery will always continue. Um, and that is the case that came up in the literature across the board in terms of all health professionals trying their best and being as diligent as possible in order to mitigate the challenges of the language barriers. So resilience was demonstrated in different ways. Practitioners created different strategies that would work to ensure that clients were engaged in the session because um, they were determined that if service delivery was going to uh, continue, it was going to do, continue at the highest level possible. But they were aware of the limitations that came up. So in conclusion, after a really quick one through the whole paper, um, this is what came out as conclusions. And like I said, it's a lot of the things that we think about and we speak about as practitioners together, but it needs to actually be put down to paper so that it can somehow voice the narratives of those um, who are having these experiences. Recommendations going forward. Oh, so before I talk about recommendations, what I want to mention is the limitations of the study. So there were operational limitations of the study because in-depth interviews were in fact conducted, but it only explored the experiences of five of the participants in a district of the Western Cape. So the specific characteristics of this district will not be represented of the whole of the Western Cape or the whole of South Africa. All of these participants were also all English speaking, which created a bias immediately in terms of it's going to go in a particular way. And all of these participants were also so in terms of recommendations for the research, in terms of the validity, validity of standardized assessments being used, so specifically from an OT perspective, um, and to address the limitations that I've just highlighted in terms of the diversity in the sample, um, in terms of race, gender, and the various districts within certain regions, um, that research into service user experiences be explored. And saying that there's a la language barrier <laughs> to actually try and explore that um, from a completely ethical perspective would be a huge endeavor, but it is something that should be prioritized. And um, all of those wonderful policies that I spoke about at the beginning, we should actually be exploring and investigating if they are actually being implemented. Um, and then for myself, as uh, someone working in higher education, it's important that we look at how we are equipping our students with the skills and the strategies to be able to navigate these language barriers and practice. Thank so much, Selena. I know in a clinical setting where I have to deal with patients and I can't speak their language is very hard and very difficult. So interesting talk, giving me some things to think about. I would rather ask the patient to come back at another time because it, to get the information, to relay the information, it, it's, it's really, very really difficult. So shukran so much. Um, are there any questions? Zakira still here, and Hadija has a question. No, it's fine, I'll, I'll speak it out. Okay. <laughs> it's not a question, just a comment on what you're saying in terms of patients having to perhaps come back because of the language barrier, but even that is a compromise of their health care. Absolutely. Because that delay isn't even appropriate. Absolutely. Um, it really is a challenge. And thank you so much for the talk. It's an interest of mine. And I think there was so 
whole much more. But so even, you know, they so many facets to it. In South African context, we need to talk about the perspective of Kosa. Kosa is a beautiful language, but now we have Sudanese people and Malawian people and all these other African nations that are now coming to us as patients. We can't even speak Kosa. And as, as general practitioners, we don't have translators in the hospital or other people to help us. So we have to rely on family members who maybe don't know the ISMI or, or things like that. It is quite difficult. Oh, that's fine. No other questions? <laughs> yes, me? Uh, thank you. This is all beautiful thoughts, really. Uh, just a reflection um, also on uh, Dr. Sabri's store. What I'm finding is really becoming a problem is um, that parents are giving um, babies devices and actually allowing them to own a device at the age of two and three. So my challenge is, is that if it is that your child is born and by six months it already is an addict, um, and by age three, you already own an iPad and a smartphone as well. Um, what then is going to be happening by the age of 15 and 16? So a lot of my time now, I actually spend speaking to parents and telling them, please, you know, the, the studies are showing that you know, if you are exposing your child to a screen before the age of two, you're definitely going to end up with an addicted child with lots of uh, all the things that um, uh, Zandra spoke about. But what, what more can we be doing as, uh, as practitioners in order to get this education out there? Should we be going to schools? Should we be addressing parents at school meetings? I don't know, but I just feel that this is a crisis and we're not doing enough. Um, and we're sitting with all this information and we're seeing all the complications already. So um, I'm, I'm a bit worried about what's going to be happening in the next 10 years. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Anybody got some yeah, I ideas? <laughs> I was going to ask the same thing as that, literally on the screen panels. Um, I just said Chanel, but I wanted to offer you a little PowerPoint. Uh, for the last uh, six months, I'm literally on GP. I've been thinking of the Dwayne's presentation in two years ago. Yes, yes. And you know, and there's something they do to go back on and they 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 
understand what the consequences is. And um, yeah, so, but you know, um, and it's, it's, there's a lot of things out there. No talk today has just surveyed on this, all of the um, challenges and also what we need to focus on. But what we need to take from here is we need to take this to our Muslim parents. Um, and um, I really want to encourage, I'm not I'm, 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 I'm knowing the strength, um, but I really feel that uh, uh, we need to use Imasa, the Imasa band. Imasa is here. We have all the professionals, we have all the um, therapists, um, the, special, uh, the specialists. Um, we, we can put together something, um, a, a program of workshops, a series of workshops that is standardized, that is practical for parents, for schools, um, and do a roadshow. Um, and take that, take that further. And uh, really, we, 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 this is something that we really can do. We have all these.
like all these SDG and so forth workers and that, who are anti workers, can actually access schools in their communities and say, you know, I've been recently for a convention and this is what's come up and is this what we want for our kids? Because, you know, in my practice, uh, and obviously, like, I, I, I understand what you're saying. In my practice, that's what I'm seeing. I have children literally between the ages of 6 and 30 whose parents will be contacting me and these children have severe anxiety and depression. So we know anxiety is a precursor to depression. Um, and, and, and the first thing we look at, what is this? Where is this coming from? Is this something going like, like the first thing that comes to business life, is there some sort of abuse going on or whatever? But what I'm saying now, this makes our, our task so much more difficult because we talk about the link between anxiety and screen time. So I think we all have a responsibility to, to reach out to schools and say, like, stop giving them online work. They're coming in. They must come in in person and do work. Yeah, we're going to work for you. Does that screen time, does that social media study include all screen time? Shock or interest that might prompt him to go and look for this again somewhere. So we had to have. 